<laughs> Hi, everybody. Dom Famular here. This is fantastic to return. You know, we use Be Live, which is allows us to bring in people from all around the world through Mapex's Facebook page. And with this today, we have Klaus Hessler here from Germany. Klaus, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, as always. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we go back a long time, Klaus, and we have done many, many events together. And it has always been my pleasure that when I, I get the chance to sit down with you, you're always thinking and creating something new. I'm really so <laughs> impressed with that. There's always something new that's in your bag of tricks. Well, I, I wouldn't say tricks. For, for the most part, it's uh, it's actually work. But the, the good news is I always enjoy the work. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, that's that's. I think that's why we all continue doing this here. And we yeah. all have to be a little bit out of our mind to be exactly uh, honest for sure the way it is. But this sure. is great. You know, in all the, the journey that we've done together with all the different clinics, you have traveled the world on behalf of Mapex. And, and I got a kick out of that class. You've been to... You in Drumio in Canada, you did Drumio, you've been to China, you've been to Berkeley, you've been to Taiwan, South America. Fill me in just about some of the traveling that you've done on behalf of Mapex and some of these events that you've, you've performed at. Well, I mean, um, the, the the list is long and and, and every, every time when somebody asks me a question like that, uh, the, the first thing is, Holy Jesus, where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's start with Drumio. Start with Drumio. How was that event flying out there with Jared and the team? What a great, great team. Yeah, I mean, that, that was just amazing. And uh, uh, it, uh, still to the very day, I've, I feel that, uh, that my performance there is one of the, I think, one of the best that I ever had. I mean, yeah, I'm yeah, still yeah, trying yeah. to go for more, as you always do. You always try to make your most recent performance your best performance. But uh, but I, I still I still have great memories about the Drumio performance and uh, uh, I just enjoyed the, the screens around me and wa watching myself playing <laughs> and, uh, uh, and and I, I still remember in one of the comments one of the guy one of the guys wrote uh, uh, I, I wish he would look at me like he is looking at the camera guy <laughs> but, <laughs> but there, there obviously, obviously was no camera guy it, it was just a screen and I was just Oh, this is what it looks like when the when the when the mirror is right in front of me on the drum set. Okay, so uh, so that was great, and uh, of course I do enjoy teaching. So it was not just that live lesson. Yeah. Um, that uh, that was a, a lot of fun. It was also like shooting a couple of lessons on open-handed playing and on molar, and uh, on collapse rudiments, which uh, which was like one of the the favorite playgrounds of uh, uh, of Forbes. I, I yeah. Should say. <laughs> and, uh, so, so that was that was huge. Drumio was was actually great. Yes, <laughs> you know it's it's amazing because at Drumio, you know they've got this incredible reach, and and I've watched your performance on there several times, and and some of the lessons. And it's always great, great stuff. And if we go back, you mentioned Forbes, James Forbes Chapin. It's amazing how his influence, even though he's been gone now for which seems like I think it's eleven years. Eleven years. Yeah. Eleven years. What's amazing about it is that he's still the presence of the greatness of his vision and his his just personality still is alive and well and and you carry it so well and i remember you talked about a lot of some of the molar stuff at the drumio lesson so just talk a little bit about that about you know your relationship with jim and what you shared and and then and maybe de demonstrate some stuff on the drums with that that'd be great yeah. um now at, at first uh, i i should say when i uh, when i began studying with uh, with jim uh, I, I was I was just following his his expertise. I didn't really know where things would take me. It it was just I, I realized okay, there is an old man who seems to know a lot about how a stick is working inside a human hand. So <laughs> I just I just trust this person and I just do what what he's telling me. So yeah. that was pretty much uh, where we started, and uh, um, and it it also turned that besides the lesson, um, I pretty much sat down in a lot of lessons that Jim would teach to a third person. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. third person would request me to stay inside the room because not everybody's English was that good. And Chapin usually didn't make any prisoners when it was about, say, talking English. So so quite some people would not understand what Jim was saying. <laughs> so I stayed in the room just trying to translate. But, uh, uh, but it was kind of cool to watch from the outside how yeah. Jim would teach the system 
and with and with yourself not being in the front line right yeah interesting so, so that, yeah. that was a, a, a very enlightening uh, situation that i experienced many times i should say so that was pretty cool it's funny with jim listen <laughs> even when he was here teaching at my studio and the person understood english i still had to go in there and translate some of the information that was going on <laughs> he was such a brilliant mind for sure yeah absolutely and uh, and i mean long story short um one, one of the one of the basic things that uh, that i usually always start teaching people uh, when it's about uh, questions on the molar system is that you understand that the choreography of up and downstroke is a different one as opposed to on the free stroke. Boy, very important point to discuss. Just to explain that briefly again. You've done it before, but I think this is a good opportunity to explain that. I mean, in, in a nutshell, with the, with the free stroke or the stop at the top or catching the bounce, it's about the tip of the stick indicating the stroke. The full stroke, the half stroke, the low stroke. The right. tip of the stick makes the stroke. Right. If you were to sit in front of a mirror with uh, with Chapin and uh, and just do this, Jim would obviously say that's a combination of an up and a down stroke. Uh -huh. But uh, but if you're watching where the stick is going, you notice the stick is almost bouncing back to the same height like on average stroke. But so yeah. how can this be a, a combination of up and down stroke? The answer is. The up and down relates to the direction of the hand yeah. at the time of the hit, not the tip of the stick. So when you watch my hand, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And every time I say down, it's pretty obvious that, that my hand is moving down. Yeah, I yeah. don't care about the, the, the tip of the stick. But there needs to be what both Chapin and Moller called the flybacks. Yeah. Which I mean, today from today's standpoint, we would say the rebound. So, so if you if you try and practice molar from that standpoint, that's I mean, just as much molar as uh, as milk is blue. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's amazing to see that this information and this knowledge being passed on by yourself, you know, from Jim to yourself, from Jim to myself, you know, it's almost like we have this real responsibility to make sure we clarify how this information is delivered and for this next generation to understand what we have. We've got some some people that are signing on right now. Maxim Dioman, who's from Kiev, Ukraine. Andy Thurston, a phenomenal teacher from, from Nottingham, UK. Uh, Les Scott, Liam Harwick. Look at this here, man. Victoria Milveskia. Oh, from Kiev, another phenomenal, phenomenal player. And uh, Steve Waychotes, look at this here. Joshua Martinez, some great, great people here. So with this here, just talk about the concept of when you go and travel, and we talked about even you going to China. What was it like in this first trip to China? Maypix is so supportive of these events, and they sent you to China. What happened with your first adventure in China? <laughs> well, I mean... Uh... Of, of course, traveling to a, to a country like China, which, uh, which is ticking totally different as opposed to most other parts of the rest of the world. I mean, yeah. there's a variety of things that you need to adjust to. It's not just the time shift. It's the food. It's the drinks. It's everything. It's, yeah. it's, it's the, the, the whole cultural background of the people that are attending. It's how people behave. It's, it's really a, a completely new world, and it's a completely different setting that you have to adjust to in, in one or the other way. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that being said, you just try to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to play the drums as good as you can, but still on top <laughs> of that, you gotta be alert at all times. Okay, what's happening next? I mean, what are people expecting from you and yeah. traveling as a, as a working musician always comes with a good amount of diplomacy. You, you need to be friendly, you need to be alert to some degree at times it's, yeah. it's a mix of all of that and uh, and what i learned is first and foremost you have to be human you mm -hmm. have to behave properly as a human being and you treat people like you want to be treated yeah, and, uh, in in case you stick to that motto let's say there's not too much that can go wrong yeah <laughs> Well, there's a certain, you know, you mentioned about the diplomacy and 
<clears throat> and I know how it is from traveling around the world at this pace. You know, not only is the, the trip a long trip, the time change is completely different. As you said, the food, the language, translation, and even so important in the translation, we have to make sure that what we're saying is being translated in the way that we want it to be translated. Sometimes the understanding of what we say and how they take it in might not be exactly there. So it really is a very, very important part of being compassionate and and empathic, our, our empathy for the person that's translating and how we deliver this. It really is a challenge. It, it is, but it can be learned. It, yeah. it's, 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 it's not rocket science. It's, uh, it, it's doable, I, I, I truly think. And... Uh, uh, and although it may sound like it's a it's a complete adventure as we speak now, I always enjoy traveling to China and traveling to Asia in special. Yeah. And, uh, I like the food, I like the people, and is it different? Yes, of course it is different, but yeah. I really like the way how it is different. It really takes an open mind to travel at this pace. I mean, as I said, with you going down from, and even you were at, at Berkeley College. Talk about Berkeley College. You went to Berkeley College in, in Boston in the U.S., and did an event there also. Yes, uh, I mean, which was special in a way because uh, I was also performing with a band. So I, I was sending out a, a complete songbook with a couple of my, say, favorite tracks. That, and we even rehearsed, which usually never happens. I yeah, mean, yeah. We, imagine you rehearse with a band the night before you go on stage. <laughs> Most of the time, that does not happen. You, yeah, right. <laughs> you can call a couple of tunes and say, "Okay, let's let's play a blues and or whatever or any standard that everybody really knows." But uh, yeah. but you don't send out sheet music and uh, and recorded music before, and and everybody would listen to that and then practice and rehearse together. Usually, that never happens. So um, yeah. uh, so that was a, a great experience. And uh, John Ramsey, who was in charge of of things. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, we, we had great talks and a lot of fun, and uh, it, it actually appeared that uh, uh, that the one of the major reasons I went there was uh, that uh, John Ramsey is good friends with David Garibaldi, and uh, so it so it appears that uh, David had called John saying, "John, I got a new hero." <laughs> <laughs> John was saying, "David, tell me what <laughs> what are you up to." There's this guy from Germany. I mean, you you, you should see his hands. And uh, and I mean, the concept, he's he's really something else. And uh, I I don't like to say that about myself, but I'm just I'm just. Yeah, no, Garibaldi you know, has the utmost respect for you, absolutely. So uh, so John said, okay, David, I take you by the word. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> gonna invite this guy. And this is how it came together. And uh, of course, we did connect a couple of other things. As I was traveling on the on the East Coast, I remember I did a clinic at your place. Still, yes, uh, yes. So great times, yeah. <laughs> it, it's pretty amazing, but you know, I, I always say that the thread that goes through here is the support that Mapex has for their artists and how they kind of believe in the fact that we want to get you out there. We want you to play for them. We want you to showcase the product, teach, and inspire this next generation. And you do this so well, really globally around the world, as you do this here. Just talk about now the drums for sake. You know, you, know, you have uh, what drums do you have there? You've been with Mapex for many, many years, and you've used the Mapex Saturns on on many, many performances that we've done together. You've also used the, the new uh, Design Lab that uh, Russ Miller has has been yes. brilliantly behind that. So talk about talk about what you have here, and let's talk about the other drums too. Yeah. So uh, I mean, when I first started out with uh, with Mapex, I went with the Orion. Uh, right. I should say. Uh, then, then sort of switched over to to the Saturn V, and it, it always was kind of hard for me to uh, to decide which one I would actually prefer. So, uh, so when I go out on the road and and I have lone gear, it's most of the times a Saturn V, and I'm always super happy with that. Uh, and it doesn't appear that often that you have great equipment which is say located everywhere in each of the countries, no matter where you travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is actually a, a, a great thing to have. So what you see here, let me switch my camera real quick so, so you can you, you can see this better. Um, so what, what you see here is yeah. actually, um, say, a, a customized Black Widow kit. Nice. I'm going to put you on. I'm going to put you on full screen, yeah. Klaus. You might not be able to hear my voice, but uh, take it away. Explain it all. Yeah. So uh, So as you see... Wait, let, let me put this thing away. 
I'm I'm starting with the with the 16 by 14 floor tom here. Then there is a, actually a relatively old um, deep forest 10 by five and a half snare. It's cherry wood uh, with with golden hardware. Uh, here is a retrosonic walnut uh, black panther snare. Um, I have my usual um, combination here with the 10 by 8, 8 by 7 rack toms, the 14 by 12, and here is a um, um, cherry bomb uh, 14 by, by 6 uh, cherry snare drum. And uh, of course, the uh, 22 by 18 bass drum. So from the top, uh, it looks somewhat like this. You see the, the, the three pedals on my, on my left here, three falcons, and uh, as we move throughout the rest of the kit, this is pretty much the whole, uh, the whole thingy here. Um, yeah, I got the, 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 the cowbells here in the middle, uh, three hi-hats actually, this one, my main hi-hat over here, and uh, and this one, which is uh, which is pretty much the the, the standard remote, uh, say closed hi hat adapter. I'm I'm just putting it into a standard uh, um, uh, uh, symbol stand, which makes it much easier for me to uh, to put this guy in place. So that is pretty much um, uh, that is pretty much. The workplace here, yeah. Well, that, that that that's a listen. That's a great office you got there for sure. <laughs> uh, talk about talk about your pedal setup. I mean, what you have is you've got the Falcon double pedal and you've got the Falcon hi hat, which is which is a two legged stand, which is really you know I, I was part of the of the design team that put that together, and it's a really solid two legged stand hi hat that works out so well. Just talk about how how you have them located and how you. Yeah, manipulate so, your feet on them. So, so, so what you see here is um, uh, uh, it's it's a, a a bit exceptional in a in a way that my my bass drum pedal is on the left side right. of my hi hat. It's yeah. not on the right side, and the main reason for that is I like to be this gap between my hi hat and my first uh, and my first rack tom to be as small as possible. Mm. I mean. There would fit a microphone still in between, but uh, but I usually don't like it if my hi hat is spread too much to right. the right uh, to the left side, right. which is why I have hi hat, bass drum, cowbell. Right. So uh, so that's pretty much the thing, and that also allows for some for some more unique combinations. Say for instance something like this. <laughs> See, the people have to understand you're playing that with your left foot, playing the cowbell and playing the, the bass drum of what you're doing. But you were also holding the microphone with one hand, so you were playing the drums with only one hand. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you had the camera in your other hand while you're playing. You got the mic on yourself. <laughs> but that but that's what you learn on the road, right? <laughs> 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 that's really really fantastic so what so uh, again what mapex offers is the, the location that you can you can get from this it really kind of gives you great flexibility to design the kit totally in your comfort zone absolutely and uh, and the great thing is that uh, no matter where you go to and, and uh, when i when i called for uh for 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 the, the the corresponding set of of hardware stuff which is in my rider which is not like the super exceptional thing that nobody has in, yeah. in no country of the world and except canada or us <laughs> or whatever um 
it, it's a, it's available m most everywhere, and uh, and I and I know and I'm confident that no matter where I travel, it I can pretty much say clone my exact kit as I have it here, and uh, and, and and get it into it, and get into the comfort zone. That yeah. which is super important for me, especially since uh, I mean it's it's definitely not the standard configuration here. The the toms are like floor toms on both sides the, the rack toms are upside down switched and uh, there's a couple of things which are not standard but still it works great every time if i have uh the solutions that mapex is offering which is great yeah which is a bit and you know i want people to understand that when when you're traveling to we mentioned drumio which is in vancouver canada mapex distributor there gets a drum set for you there as they have for me in in many of my travels and i was just there at drumio when you're in South America, the South American distributor organizes that in Taiwan, in China. This is, you know, some of the challenges. So whenever you're, you're traveling there, you're getting a, a new kit that you've got to configure and set up. You know, I mean, it's almost like the color doesn't matter. As long as they have your sizes and they have the gear there, all systems are go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It's pretty amazing. So talk about now with, with um, so you're playing, is this like a Black Widow kit, this one here? Yeah, it's it's pretty much a black widow just with a different varnish, but that's, right. that's pretty much it. Yeah. And the black widow is an all maple kit, right? It's it's an all maple shell, no reinforcing hoops. It still has the sonic saver hoops, which right. I which I like a lot, by, yeah. by the way. So yeah, sure. Goes, yeah. For, those, for those of you who don't know, they the sonic saver hoops they come with this little curved yeah. uh, thingy at the top. In comparison, say to a hoop like that, which is right. bent outwards. Right, right. Um, the Sonic Saber hoop is different. The, the, the main reason why I like the, the Sonic Saber so much um, is that from, uh, from a standpoint of tuning, they come relatively close towards what you would expect from a die cast hoop. Hmm. But uh, they are just much lighter. And I always felt die cast hoops uh, sort of... Uh, yeah, kind of. It, it, it I, I find also it chokes the sound and what it's sound. Yeah, yeah it, so the, the the and I always want the drums to be uh, not muffled sounding, open ringing. I mean, yeah. what what you see here, it, there is no gaffer tape at all. Yeah. I might use a, a super little pillow inside my bass drum, that but that's already it. In that bass drum, there is no pillow at all. Wow, it, it's it's just what it is. And since I know that uh, I, I, I need no extra configuration in terms of muffling and all of that when I go on the road, I just put my drum heads on. Boop, done. Wow. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Do me a favor. I want, I want you to play a little of this kit here. We've got some people that are joining us from Argentina. We've got, uh, you know, my gosh, people from all over the place, you know, the, the U.S., all throughout Germany. This is fantastic. Just play a little, Klaus, so we can hear that kit. And what you're doing in there and demonstrate you know some of your feet stuff and just give the people the understanding that you know you've designed this mapex kit in your own way you know i always you know love it when i when i travel around the world and i take pictures of each of the different artists that i perform with i take a picture of their drum set no two kits are alike <laughs> it's amazing and, and yours also is is uh extremely comfortable for yourself so just just play a little here let's see if we can get this thing to sound okay, let's see Let's see what we got.
I love this. I love it so well. You know, I, again, you started with a, a shuffle feel on the cowbell with your left foot. Yep. And on top of the shuffle feel, you opened up incredibly, you know, tons of different time you know, rhythms on top of that. Then you went to like a jazz rhythm with your left foot. Kind of, yes. Right? You know, chang, chang, chang. It, it, it's incredible. And I saw you do that. We did a camp together in Poland which was fantastic. The open-minded drumming camp, which is a fantastic camp that hopefully is going to happen again in, in some way or another uh, later on this year, yeah. whether it's in person or whether it's online. But you did a thing where you played your hi-hat playing the jazz ride rhythm, chang, chang, a chang, with just your left foot. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's close to that. It's, it's some sort of a fake uh, but uh, uh, but it, it comes actually pretty close to what uh, you would it, expect from a yeah, it, it, it sounded great. It felt good. It it swung, and then once that was going by itself in its own little world, then what you put on top of that, you layered so many great things while that hi hat <laughs> continued to play at that steady rhythm, which was just, just <laughs> beautiful, and which which reminded me a lot of Morello. You know, in the early days of Joe Morello, mm -hmm. when he played Take Five, it was in five four, and his hi hat was on two and four, in five four. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And we'd watch him play, you know, and back in the you know late 1960s, early 70s, this was like, you know, holy mac, this is so That's incredible. Cool. Exceptional, yes. It would have been great for him to see <laughs> what a player like you are doing with that. Morello would have loved this to the highest level to see that level of independence and that level of creativity. But but I should I should also say uh uh, with one of the super old uh, videotapes that I still have from uh, from Joe Morello, I also actually saw something like this. So he definitely did do that at times. Yeah. And, and was playing stuff on top of that. Uh, I mean, I never saw him do that with uh, with Dave Brubeck or in a, in a band like setting, but uh, but I remember. A little solo spot, which was on on one of the of, of the videotapes, uh, with uh, with Joe playing the, actually the, the exact jazz cymbal rhythm on the hi hat with his left foot. Yeah, and he didn't go super crazy with his hands, but uh, but when I I still remember when I saw that first, I was, what the freak is that? <laughs> is, is this any possible? And uh, yeah. It's, it's so great to see that these, listen, you are clearly standing on the shoulders of these giants and you are paying such honor and tribute to them, which is so wonderful to see. Really, really fantastic. Talk about, just talk about if you would, open-handed playing. You know, you, you put out a couple of great, great books on the topic and just talk about it and how you have your setup set up that way and about how you're playing with your left hand lead on the hi-hat and how you have that freedom. Just, just you know, plant the seed a little bit with this, these people that are listening right now. Yeah, um, I mean, maybe be, before I play you uh, just a little something to, uh, to to back up what I'm what I'm saying, yeah. I, sh I should mention that um, uh, with my kit, it's not really uh, it's it's it, it's not really mirror like from from left to right. right. But uh, there is some there are a couple of good reasons why things are set up the way they are set up. Hmm. So uh, um, so just so you know. Um, uh, the, the 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 not really the exact pitch, but uh, but the tonality of the toms kind of mirrors the tonality of the cowbells. So mm. if you watch the toms, which is this, and now the the tonality of the cowbells. Mm, interesting. So it 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 goes somewhat this direction. Sorry. <laughs> so, it's very interesting. And that allows me when I'm soloing, for instance, um, to to sort of uh, copy certain melodies. From the toms to the to the cowbells and vice versa, or mix these voices, yeah. uh, which uh, which changes something about my musical perception. So uh, uh, I pr I pretty much look at at this whole beast here as uh, as an orchestra, and uh, yeah. I mean it's not an orchestra like Terry Bozio's orchestra, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, 
but it's that's still basically how I look at the drums. Yeah. You're the person, you're the conductor, and you're trying to uh, to organize these different voices. Yeah, um, yeah. So I also do have three hi hats here. I have low toms on both uh, on both sides. I have three snare drums, which uh, uh, which allows me to to say um, play the same groove using different settings using different feel. So uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you, for, for sure you noticed uh, I'm, I'm mixing these, these different voices. So the, 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 the lowest pitched hi-hat together with the lowest pitched snare creates yeah. some super fat low end kind of groove. Yeah. The, the, the smallest hi-hat with the smallest snare with the, with the same construction of notes completely changes the, changes the, 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 the vibe of, of, of how the mm. groove sounds like although the notes on paper, the notation would maybe even exactly the same. So, yeah. um, so um, to a good degree, the sound and, the, and, and your choice of sound and, and the way how you manipulate how the drums sound, that changes a lot about the expression that you put out and that changes a lot about the message that you can give to the people. And, uh, and I mean, most people you play for are not drummers, let's face it. Right. But yeah. uh, but they will for sure understand the different degree of energy, the the finesse or the low end or the high pitched or the aggressive or the whatever the quality may be. People relate to that. They may not have names for it and they may not have nomenclature for it. But uh, but I'm I'm super happy that uh, that a company like Mapex is putting all these different drums out <laughs> that are available so I, I can use them and and play around with them like a kid in a in a in a sandbox pretty much <laughs> but i think what's really amazing class is that you really have stepped back and you look at the instrument like you said like an orchestra and you are you are really kind of composing and and bringing in these different sounds and bringing in combinations of sounds not only how you tune the drums which they sound so fantastic but your choice of symbols in how you mesh them and and, and bring them together with the drums. And this is really what I think I want the next generation to understand. Not every drummer does that. You know, it's interesting. Jeff Hamilton joined us here, who's a phenomenal, phenomenal drummer, as you know. And actually, I'm going to be interviewing him next Monday on June 1st, same wow. time at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Uh -huh. So I want you all to join back to hear Jeff Hamilton. But Jeff's another one of these guys. Like, what you do is you really kind of bring that cymbal sound and that drum sound together in a blend that just makes it so pleasing that even a person that is not a drummer feels the positive vibe that comes out of the sounds that we're delivering. <laughs> With, and, and that's, I think, what it's, what it's all about. I mean, if, if only the drummers like what I do, uh, <laughs> what, what should I do with that? I mean, <laughs> and, and I'm not saying everybody has to like what I do. If, if everybody likes what I do, 
possibly I'm doing something wrong. So <laughs> I, I would I would rather go with uh, a couple of people that don't like what I do. <laughs> I, I'm fine with that. Uh, it, 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 I mean, the, the worst thing in the world uh, and the, the biggest punishment for my drumming is if somebody says, that's boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, hurt. that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts, yeah. <laughs> but again, a little bit of friction creates heat. And where there's heat, there's fire. Bring it on. So that's a, that's yeah. something something good also. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds great. But you have such incredible freedom that you have. And you talk about it in your in your two open-handed books. If you have those books there, just show them, Klaus. Just show the crowd yeah. what we have here, too. So uh, it's, uh, it's actually uh, open-handed playing volume one and volume two. Uh, volume two, I should say, is, uh, is uh, working on linear phrasing and the use of rudiments around the kit. And uh, volume one has uh, two different approaches, which we, which we ended up calling the voice variation approach and the traditional approach. So, um, so th th this is not saying that Volume one is the one you start with, and volume two is uh, is more advanced. So you you only do that later. You can start with any book. You can you can work at them yeah. simultaneously, yeah. pretty much. It's just different roads that lead you to Rome. Yeah. But there's no higher road or or whatever road. It's it's all the all the same roads. Yeah. It's really kind of interesting because when I teach out of the book and I use I always have both books at the same time. And I tell them, and I explain the four different directions of where they are and let them choose where they might want to go. They might want to choose one part from book two and one part from book one. And it's that, it's that you know, mix of all of it that I think helps to understand what the true potential is of open-handed playing. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, and I mean, like with the, with the first uh, volume, uh, um, and, and with that even more as opposed to volume two, uh, the, the first book pretty much described a lot of the exercises that in, in the first place I would write for myself uh, mm -hmm. on the on the way back from from many years of playing hands crossed back to open handed where I originally started as a kid. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, uh, so which which makes that book really different uh, to me because um, I, I am I am the I was the better testing student. Uh, <laughs> Sort of trying out what 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 you guys out there can now have with the book. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, I mean, make no mistake, there were lots of pages which did not make it into the book. Yeah. And uh, and there were some of the pages which just made it at the very last moment and anything in between. But uh, it was basically all about figuring out ways to uh, to make full use of the of the full potential that goes with open handed playing. Yeah. So, for instance, like, uh, I mean, something which, which everybody out there may have heard or, or experienced, you play a groove, everything is fine, you play a fill, and all of a sudden, not everything is fine. <laughs> you speed up or slow down, or, or the, the, the pulse does not really stay solid, and your count of one is not the count of one of everybody else in the band. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so keeping a hi-hat rhythm steady and then pretty much playing fill-like structures around that is one of the one of the important cornerstones of the traditional approach. Say mm. something like this, for instance. Yeah. So fantastic. Any, anything that allows you to uh, to keep the hi-hat rhythm going and then play the fancy stuff with your strong hand, yeah. which is kind of really interesting. And uh, it reminds me of, of one story that I experienced uh, a couple of years ago. A student of uh, a student came and uh, and it turns that he also played open handed. And uh, and I would say, boy, interesting. Are, are you left handed or what, what's your what's your personal background? 
And he would say, no, I'm right-handed and right-footed. So, so I said, why do you choose to play open-handed? And he says, well, I mean, a couple of eighth notes, playing that with my left hand, that's a piece of cake. But then I can play the real hip stuff with my <laughs> good hand. Why, why should I waste my good right hand for a couple of eighth notes? I don't get the point. And, uh, what, a, what a great way of thinking. That really is fantastic. Abs it absolutely is, I think. And uh, I mean, playing all kinds of groupings against the, against the hi-hat rhythms and, and all of that. Uh, I mean, you can do that musically, but first and foremost, uh, what these structures with groupings around um, a, a certain hi-hat would do for you is they create a lot of different combinations. Right. And, uh, and from that point on, it's pretty much like, like a chess player. If you have a chess player who has seen a lot of different positions on the board, yeah, those are the kings, right? Yeah. If you haven't seen a lot of different positions on the board, uh, you lose most of the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so getting getting the to know the positions which there are to know on these uh, on on this set of drums, uh, that's what what takes you to a, a completely different level. This, yeah. this is pretty much how I look at it. Well, that's fantastic. Was that a, is that a 20 inch bass drum on that kit? Uh, that's 22. At the 22 on that kit. Wow, that's fantastic. It just it sounds great, man. It just really, really sounds great. So this is and this is the Black Widow kit that you have, but you've also played and and, and also have you know a, a Saturn kit. Uh, I I mean most of most every time when I go out on the road and I play long stuff, uh, long gear, it's nine out of ten times a Saturn five. And uh, uh, I mean, just last year, I also got to play some of the anniversary um, kits, which mm. uh, which Mapex has out, which are simply amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I remember I, I played a, a kid in Spain late November last year, uh, which was back in the good old back in the good old days when when people would still travel and, and <laughs> people coming to shows. Believe it or not. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I played one of these anniversary kits, was, which was just amazing, at uh, Alteza Drum Fest, together with uh, with Ash Sohn and uh, um, and um, uh, Annika still was was uh, was on board, and and Derek McKenzie of, of nice. Sugar Boy. yeah, so nice great and great drums, by the way. Yeah. How really fantastic! But I also do play a uh, a cherry bomb when I when I go out on the road and uh, and I perform. With uh, with my equipment, uh, I have um, I have my cherry bomb with me. This is pretty much one of the snares that uh, that goes with the cherry bomb, which I no. have uh, now super low tuned. Um, yeah, but it also goes with my standard configurations like the the, the ten inch, the eight inch, fourteen, sixteen, yeah. and, uh, the the ten inch snare and the fourteen inch snare. And there may be any other. 14 inch snare on top of that that i use for the for the low end tuning at times not at always time. but many times yeah. yeah yeah but it's so it's so great how you how you've evolved into your kit the way it is and it's just, it's just so exciting but you also did the um the, the uh, demo video which is online of the design lab the mapex design lab so just talk about that kid you having had the chance to put your hand on some of the mounts out of the mind of russ miller this is you know absolutely incredible I mean, th this is this is completely freaking crazy. Yeah. And, uh, um, uh, and, and I understand that uh, it it may not be for everybody, but I I just I just love the way how open and how and how resonating and how free everything sounds. And and with me being a, a, a complete fan of no muffling at all, this yeah. is this is heaven. So yeah. when I when I see drums resonating and and moving like that. This is this is what I want to have. Yeah, yeah the best, the best. <laughs> I mean, for for the most part, I never adjust anything on that, but uh, but just uh, but just the the opportunity to have a drum resonating as free as that is, I mean, astounding from a technical side, but also makes uh, a huge difference if you're sitting behind these drums and if you notice all of a sudden what the drums are giving back to you. Right, and, right. And if you're sitting. In the center of this one-man orchestra, it's it's just amazing. You know, it's incredible. I had the chance of, of interviewing Russ Miller, the, 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 my first session that I had with the Mapex Live here. And so, not only are the tom toms adjusted with different 
thickness of wood because of the shape of the drum to give it its most vibration. Mm -hmm. The the floor tom legs are angled to a certain degree mm -hmm. that allows the drum to resonate the most that a, drum, a tom can resonate sitting on the floor, which I was blown away. It was for a long time that that drum opened up. And then the mounting system is that of a magnet system that through the magnet, you can adjust the wideness of the magnet that you want. Yeah. So, I mean, this really is 21st century technology in a drum set at its best. It is. And uh, uh, and and what I also liked a lot, actually, especially with, with the Cherry Bomb, which is the Design Lab kit that, that I'm using, is that as the name as the name would suggest, it's made of cherry wood. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the, the aspect that I like about it has some sort of environmental quality because uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of exotic woods and all of that. I think we cut down enough trees yeah. in the rainforest yeah. and it should not be for, uh, for a couple of drums that we cut down even more of these. Yeah. But cherry wood is pretty much available anywhere in Asia. Yeah. It's a very common wood. And uh, and it's nothing, nothing. It's no exotic rainforest, whatever wood. Yeah. Um, and and I just I just like that idea. And the interesting yeah. thing on top of that is, um, it comes sort of kind of in the middle, let's say, between what you would expect from from a standard maple shell and a standard mahogany shell. Yeah. And if if you guys ever played mahogany, and if you guys ever played maple, the cherry is. In, in a surprising and, and very pleasant way, pretty much in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and that's what I like even more because the mahogany, I was never like a, a super big fan of it uh, yeah. with pure mahogany shells, plus the fact with, with all that rainforest shit, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Point well taken. Well, it's great. Well, again, you, you are such a great promoter of Mapex and how you play it's so wonderful. Your creativity on the kit is just so open and free. And, you know, the drums have that, that because um, I don't use any muffling also. They have that Stradivarius vibration mentality where you know a Stradivarius is made so it vibrates so you hear the wood and the sound of the openness you know you don't go buy a Stradivarius and start wrapping gaffer tape on it to tighten the sound you know oh. so the this the, the the workmanship that goes behind it really is well thought out so you know people that purchase mapex are really getting an instrument that has been you know through the the the, the design process several times and the balance of those engineers and the artists that really is something which is yeah. really, really brought together very, very well. I, I, I completely agree. And there's a, uh, there's a couple of things on top of that. Uh, number one is uh, if, you, if you, or if I, would, if I were to buy an instrument and then uh, put the muffling and then try 10 different kinds of, of drum heads and then do all, all these little things that, of which I think they need to be done in order to make the sound uh, cool and, and the way I want it to be, Oh, that, that's a lot of work. And, uh, and, and when I, and when I notice I, I, I play a, a lone kit from, from Mapex, I put it out of the box. I put my drum, my favorite drum heads on and I get the sound I want. I don't have yeah. to change a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's just, I, I tune them boom, ready to go. And uh, this, this is what I want to have from a drum. I, I don't need to, or I don't want to do all these extra twists and turns and, yeah, and good point. Secret, whatever it, it has it has to be it has to sound the way i want it to sound in the best possible case right out of the box Boy, Just great, great. make a few adjustments and off you go great point man the, the simplicity of trying to get a great sound fast is really and the older i get i want it faster and i want it greater so and it works out which is which is as we travel around the globe out of the box you get it fast thank you very much and we get down to the playing end of it yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> Let's just, I want to talk about percussion creative. If you would just talk about that, uh, you know, this was a, was started by Udo Daman many, many years ago. You've taken over in the helm of percussion creative, which is a, an organization based of, and are they all educators and teachers that are involved with it? Uh, I mean, most of them are educators uh, slash teachers, but, uh, but also quite some of them are pretty much just hobbyists that, that like to play right. the drums. So everybody can be a part of it. And it's, it's right. just, uh, a let's say a community of of the, the 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 sister and brotherhood of drummers 
And mm. drummers have always been a special breed, as as we all know, as we are sitting here and, and listening to this, drummers have always been special. And they had a certain tendency to stick together in one or the other way. Yeah. And, uh, and Percussion Creative is just, say, that umbrella-like organization that puts this all into shape in the German-speaking part of, uh, of Europe. We're not limited to drum set players, although many of us or most of the members are drum set players, I should, I should mention. But we also have a, a lot of percussionists, world percussion, classical percussion, hand percussion, whatever percussion. Uh, yeah, that's you, you mention it. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is great. And you're going to have a camp that we were planning on in August that you, we might have to change, you know, because of the virus of what's happening with it. But that's still going to happen in August too. We, you know, a couple of times, you know, you put these these camps together, which is fantastic to share that kind of knowledge to have it together. Uh, yes, and, and and we keep inviting different people, and uh, and we, I mean, we are not say a, a super big rich organization with with tons of money. We just try to to do our best in in terms of uh, forwarding education <clears throat> and uh, and helping uh, this this brother and sisterhood of drummers. Yeah. So uh, so this time uh, or for for, uh, for the for the drum camp, which is supposed to take place this year. We have, uh, I mean, yourself, yourself, which will be online via Zoom. Yeah. Uh, most likely, we have Derek McKenzie of Jamiroquai. Fantastic. Uh, the original idea was to have David Garibaldi, and David wanted to be part of it, but it, it sort of collided with uh, uh, with the Tower of Power gig that then popped up kind of at the last moment before the virus popped up. So <laughs> it, it was too sad that David couldn't make it, but. Uh, we were so close to having him. To having him. <laughs> next um, time we'll get him. We'll get him next time. Sure. And uh, um, actually, my my cousin Annika will still be on it. Fantastic. And uh, and, um, and still Andy Gilman, who is uh, another great drum set player here in Germany, who has been with Percussion Creative, uh, Creative yeah. for many years. Great player, yeah. Um, and uh, Stefan Maas on percussion. Uh, being an, an, an outstanding Latin percussion cajon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great educator, great person, and uh, so it's it's for sure going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Boy, this is absolutely fantastic to see that you that as you're as you're progressing with this incredible momentum of what's going on with this here. This is really amazing to see the the forward motion that you're creating, not only in Germany with Percussion Creative, and the team that you have, because I know you have Norbert Grande helps out, and he's involved with the. Uh, with getting the word out of what you're doing to assist you. So you've got a great team of people that are assisting you with that to get the word out. And like I say, not only in Germany, this goes out worldwide. When you do the teacher uh, the tagos, the teacher days, um, and I, I've attended several of them, I think they were in Hamelburg, right? Is that where they, yeah. they were helping? A fantastic yeah. facility that were there and all these drummers get together and we just share ideas and it's just incredible. And Benny yeah. Greb has been there and all this, unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, uh, I mean, we also put out uh, our own list of uh, of rudimental patterns of uh, of European origin, I should say. Nice. Um, which is called the Rudimental Codex. So if you go to my website, you can download um, a, a, a copy of the Rudimental Codex, which is a, a poster with uh, with forty plus patterns. Yeah. Most of them uh, being, say, somewhat different from the way uh that uh, that you may find these patterns in in other lists this is not meant to rival other listings and collections of, of rudimental patterns but we just thought it would make a lot of sense to to put out word that rudiments and the art of rudimental drumming actually originated in europe yeah uh, with france switzerland parts of germany i mean the, the borders back then a couple of hundred years ago were oh, totally different so yeah. We we cannot really say it was France or it was Switzerland or it was Germany or it was parts of this parts of that. It, which is why I choose to call it. It's a European tradition, but yeah. the, the French roots are quite strong in there. Yeah. And what makes the rudimental codex different is that we also offer say uh, hints towards uh, authentic interpretation, mm. uh, and we offer names in three different languages, and we also offer quite some phrases. Which uh, which are not included in um, in the list of forty PAS rudiments. Yeah. And most people, for instance, have may have never heard about a certain rudiment, which is a, a part of the codex. Yeah, 
you know, it's it's kind of interesting with 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 what this is. And you mentioned the European part of it, and all of my travels to Europe for the past thirty some odd years, there really is a history that is there. That listen, in America, we we may have marketed it well, but in the early nineteen hundreds, when we started putting this all together, we took this from all the Europeans that came and 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 immigrated to America. We started pulling this and we started marketing the information, but it really started from that early days going back to even even in Basel, my gosh, all the yeah. the early history they have there. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and uh, I mean, just 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 today, as, as uh, b before we went off to go live, uh, I was uh, I was in an email um, correspondence with uh, uh, with somebody from the Chicago University uh, researching about um, uh, about rudiments and the and and the and their fashion and interpretation how they were used uh, on the island of St Kitts and Nevis interesting uh, which is uh, which is british of course but uh, but there were elderly people veterans from uh, uh, from the army that that were interviewed and they would say a good part of that or the most part of that goes back to french traditions mm. but uh, nowadays Nobody actually knows a lot about that anymore. So, which is why the the Chicago University contacts me to to back up uh, their research on British rudiments as they were performed uh, in that part of the Caribbean. I mean, how crazy is that? <laughs> well, it's it's listen. The research you have done, Klaus, more than anyone else that I know of, in that tradition of going back. And again, this codex, I ask everyone go to klaushessler.com. Go to the website. And download this because it really is interesting. It's creative. It is. It is going back to the to the real roots of where we started with our art form, and delivering it well now into the 21st century. It really is very very exciting and very creative. You've been doing it. I mean, you've been doing this for years, and it's now starting to really get words out. You have yeah. a guy. <laughs> I mean, one hobby needs to be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, Klaus, it's so great to have you here and have this 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 hour of talking with you. You are a great representation for Mapex. You really are a, a, an absolute ambassador for the product line. You go out there, you play them, and just when you play them, they always sound fantastic. No matter where we are, when we're together, whether it's in Europe or Australia or China or South America, we meet up in Canada. It's always great to meet up with you because there are so many great ideas that come out of what you're doing. So keep this energy going. Keep strong. Stay healthy. Fantastic to have you here. Thank you so, so much on behalf of Mapex. And we thank Mapex for giving us this opportunity yes. to be able to come by here and have this voice through their Facebook page. This will go on to their YouTube channel. If anybody is not here right now or share it with your friends, if they couldn't be it, have them go back and watch it again. Check it out. Analyze Klaus's playing because people are going to be researching Klaus for years to come. You know, <laughs> ongoing. When, when he plays, we're going to be stealing those ideas for many, many years, as I just stole more ideas today. So thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Always a pleasure talking with you and uh, and always a great pleasure to, to play Mapex gear. And, uh, and I can't thank them enough for giving me the platform to uh, express my my musical ideas and, and, and thoughts. I, I just feel at home when I'm sitting behind a set of those. Oh, man, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And next week, June 1st, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to have Jeff Hamilton here. Oh, my gosh. Oh we'll have some more ideas and more creativity and more artistic standards that are going to be at a high level with Jeff also, as we have with you, Klaus. Thank you so much. Stay well, and I'll talk to you real soon, all right? I will. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>